The Old Man of the Three is brought to you by Cash App. When personal finance connects you to both your funds and the stuff that matters, that's money. And that's Cash App. You know what else is money? Choosing your own cash tag. That's money. Using it to request the $50 your squirrely cousin owes you. Actually finally getting that $50. Your table agreeing French toast is for sharing. Splitting the karaoke room bill. Tommy knows about that. While still holding the high note. That's money. Digging a hole with friends. That's money. Hearing a wildly good musician on the train home and tipping their cash tag. Watching a fine pastry float down a river. That's money. Getting paid to read a wonderful ad script from our good friends at Cash App. That's money. Sending everyone in the group chat a good night dollar. Waking up to all those good morning dollars. Sending, spending, saving, investing, splitting, tipping, donating, gifting, or just typing numbers, all with the number one finance app in the App Store. I would also like to add making a birdie putt on 18 to close out a match. That's money. That's Cash App. Download Cash App from the App Store or Google Play Store today to add your cash tag to the 80 million and counting. Welcome to The Old Men of the Three with JJ Reddick and Tommy Alter, presented by Cash App and brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 126. Ben Simmons, Tommy, we are back. It's good to be back. We're back. Uh, we, back we with a big hope, one. Back with a big one, right? Back with a big one. We've been trying to get Ben on for years. I, I tried to get him on the JJ Reddick podcast with The Ringer. We tried to get him on The Old Man and the Three. Um, we've had some very close calls where we thought we were going to get it done. So we're really excited that this actually happened. Uh, before we get to Ben, we should first of all apologize for the longer than expected break. We were always going to take a few weeks off in August following the Jalen Brunson episode. Um, our contract with our old ad sales partner, Cadence, expired on Onyx first. And as we were sort of gearing up to put out more episodes, uh, there was just a, a little bit longer of a delay than we would have liked. We apologize. As always, thank you for listening. We announced our new partnership with Wondry Plus and uh, Amazon last week. Uh, what does this mean? If you listen on Spotify, if you listen on Apple, if you watch on YouTube, nothing is going to change specifically for Wondry Plus subscribers. If you download the app, you sign up for Wondry Plus, you get ad-free uh, podcast, and you also will get uh, some bonus content during the NBA season. We'll start that up in uh, in several weeks, and, and that'll run weekly as well. Um, so there's there's some good stuff if you're a Wondry Plus subscriber. Uh, if you're not, no worries. Nothing will change with the podcast. Uh, it'll be like it always was. Your experience will be uh, basically the exact same. Uh, on to Ben Simmons. Uh, Tommy, we touched on just about everything with Ben. Um, uh, you know, some of the things, his background, obviously, uh, his time with the Sixers, the highs and lows of his six, Sixers experience. Of course, we talked about shooting. We talked about the Nets. We talked about his year off. Um, and I felt like he gave us honest, open, candid answers. I mean, this is a guy who came to the show ready to share his thoughts. Yeah, Ben, he's had a very interesting um, life for being 26 years old. He's been through a lot. Uh, and so we, we, get into, we get into this with him. And, you know, we've both known him now for a long time. And we've sort of seen the growth uh, that he's had over the years. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to hear him finally talking about it because he has resisted talking about it for the last two years. Uh, and it's, it's, it's exciting. I think, it's, I think we both left the conversation being happy for him you know, and where he is just in life. Yeah, no, he seems like he's in a great place, both physically and mentally headed into the season. Uh, the Nets are going to have high expectations on them, of course, because Kyrie and Kevin are back and uh, there was some uncertainty around that. Uh, a healthy Ben Simmons combined with the shooting that they have. Um, this is a team that, uh, you know, <laughs> drama side will be a formidable team in the Eastern Conference. Um, you know, I, 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 Again, going back to some of the stuff we talked about, like we we asked him specifically about the Atlanta series, his last series and last time playing for the Philadelphia 76ers. We asked him about the move where he passed and could have dunked on Trey Young. Um, so we get into a lot of, of real sp specifics with Ben, and I think you guys are really going to enjoy this conversation. Coming up, uh, we will be back on our weekly cadence uh, throughout the season. Um, we'll be delivering you uh, at least one episode a week, sometimes two. Um, and just so you know, we have uh, four other episodes in the bag right now, um, four of which or three of which are with players that have all been all-stars and all-NBA. 
and one with uh, one of the best coaches in the NBA for the return of our coaching series. So there's a lot of good stuff for you guys coming up. As always, thank you for listening to the show. Please subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Wondery, wherever you listen to your podcast. Uh, we appreciate you guys. And let's get to our conversation with Brooklyn Net, Ben Simmons. All right, let's welcome in Ben Simmons. Uh, first of all, for clarity's sake, Ben, um, I've only worn sunglasses on the podcast one other time. It was the day after that I retired. We were actually with Matisse, your old teammate. And it was because I'd had like a very emotional morning and I didn't want my bloodshot eyes to... I wore glasses today because I wanted to look cool for you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. That's the truth. That's I appreciate the truth. that. I, the one thing when... So we, we uh, Tommy and I were talking about this. We have tried for a long time and and came very close a few times to getting you on the podcast. Very close, like within hours. Yeah. It was close, <laughs> but I'm here now. It was close. It was one it time was, it was literally, we were across the hall from each other and it didn't happen. I'd like to apologize for that. <laughs> it's all good. But the, my thought I'm driving in, I'm, I'm driving in today from, uh, from Sag Harbor back to Brooklyn. My thought is, is Ben going to speak with an Australian accent, American accent or oscillate between the two? If I have a few more glasses of wine, the Australian, the Australian comes out heavy. It comes out heavy. And I started noticing that probably when I was like 22. One long night and I was just fucking, somebody was recording me and it was not good, but yeah, it came out strong. I've seen you do, I've seen you do some, I think you did a couple of late night shows early in your career. And I have noticed on those shows, the Australian accent came out a little bit more. It, I feel like it comes out when I need to like articulate everything properly and for people to really understand what I'm saying. Um, but I think now I just, it's kind of just fallen into a place where it's just stable. I have this little unique accent. Our relationship, by the way, Tommy, um, I think I've told you this before, and hopefully the statute of limitations have, have sort of waned on this, but our relationship actually started before we were teammates. Because of, we got to give Doug Rosenberg a shout out. I was with him last night. He's like, you know what? I introduced you to the JJ. I'm like, yeah, you did. I appreciate that. <laughs> it was, uh, I think it was January of my last year with the Clippers. And we, uh, we played you guys. You were hurt, obviously. Mm -hmm. we played you guys in Philly. You guys came back and beat us. There was like maybe 10,000 people in the stands. And I remember thinking like, man, if they ever get this thing going here, Philly could be awesome. Uh, you know, an awesome place to play. And then I met Doug after the game and he's like yo let me introduce you to sean your brother yep. sean and i talked and then you and i ended up connecting on text and um you basically tampered you basically tampered <laughs> <laughs> please come to philly tampered no. effectively i was uh just watching you play like in that moment for me i was like this is who i want to play with like the way you were playing the way you move like your iq and people don't you're not fucking out there dunking like you're not that guy above the rim but the way you play in your iq for me i was like we have to have him and it just for my game, just you, it's fucking easy. Like playing with somebody like you was just easy. How did how did you know at that point? You know that obviously everyone wants shooters, but like how did you know at that point that like guys like JJ would be such a perfect fit with? Because he, he's a winner. There's a difference between guys who can just go out and you know put numbers up, but he he wants to win. And just the way you play and like obviously your leadership, the way you are as a person, that was perfect for. I wish we had you earlier. You know my rookie year when I came in. Um, but like, that's, that's not normal. Like not guys can't go out there and make others better. And people don't understand that it's a huge part of basketball too. Like making somebody else better. That's, that's basketball. It's five and five. You know, I feel like the fit was good. Like I, I everybody always talked about Joel and I's two man game, Yeah, but you and I had a real like partnership out there. Obviously we'd run some dribble handoffs and stuff. But in transition, you always knew where I was. And actually, I got probably one or two layups a game when you went to your post-ups because I would just cut. Yeah, and you were well, I I, you had a head on a swivel. You always knew. Yeah. And I remember one time you said to me, I was asking you, I was like, hey, I'm going to do this next time. Do you think you can make this pass? And you're like, I'm six foot 10. I can make any fucking pass. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. I made those passes. Like that, those years were so much fun. Like going up and down the floor with you guys, Marco Bellinelli, even Urson. Like it was just such a unique team. And it was just like, it was free. We just played free. Everyone was running. Everyone's having a good time. I, I was going to ask you about that stretch uh, at, at the end of that season before the playoffs when you guys won because 16 Miami? in a row. Before, before Miami, a row. you won 16 in a row. Yeah. And it was sort of you and then it was just 
a bunch of sh- three a bunch of white guys, <laughs> and it was like nobody could stop you. Is there was there a part of that that you like? You look at that now, and you're like, this is the this is the optimal fit for me. In terms no, that's of basketball. basketball to me. That's basketball. Like being in growing up in Australia, like the way we play is just fundamentally. Obviously, not everyone's super athletic. When you come to the states, it's different. <laughs> But it's moving the ball, it's cutting, it's passing, it's running. Like that's that's what basketball is. Like the game here is a lot different. Um, but you see, even with the Spurs, when Brett was trying to bring that to Philly, like I I saw the idea of what he was trying to do. Um, and we had a great run, sixteen in a row. It was just we were just flowing. What what stands out for you in that run? Like, is there a specific game moment when we won those sixteen games? Row? And by the way, it was seventeen games when you include game one of the Miami series, yeah. but was there a specific game that stands out for you? <sighs> no. What about you? I think for me, it was the Cleveland game at home. That was a great game. Cause we, <laughs> it was a great game. cause we got up 30 yeah. in the second quarter. Yeah. And it was, I mean, I I've watched highlights of that game and the ball movement, the player movement, um, it, everything, it was like so fine tuned yet. So random. So it was so hard to guard. And that was probably Cleveland's worst defensive team with right. LeBron. So they they just had no clue. And then LeBron brought them all the way back. I think it was like a one-point <laughs> yeah, He was game. going crazy. <laughs> I think was, it was like was a one-point game. Yeah. Uh, and then you got an offensive rebound, and I think I hit a big shot from the corner to kind of seal the deal with a Is that to go. You? Yeah, that's when I threw up the hands to the crowd. <laughs> Great moment. Ah, oh, good days. <laughs> Very good days. You, you mentioned sort of basketball IQ. Do you think that your basketball IQ is often overlooked by not even just average casual NBA fans, but just the NBA world at large? For sure. I think so. I don't know. It's like, it's easy to just say like, you know, pick, nitpick things about a player. But when you actually look at it and the amount of points I kind of generate in terms of like just different ways, it's a lot of numbers. It's a lot of points. Like, and we did some amazing things in Philly, but I think it is overlooked. Um, that's okay. JJ, I was going to ask you this for both of you guys about the the instincts of passing because you've always been like this. LeBron's obviously like this. They're you know guys you can probably count on one or two hands who they seem to they seem to make the right pass every time down the court, no matter what. Yeah. And you've been like that since you came into the league. Can you kind of like describe to the audience how hard it is to actually? do that all the time it's very difficult it is um but for me it's natural like it's easy to be like yes it's hard but for me it's it's easy like i don't like some passes i make it's just it's a feel and the way i move in my body and just seeing like a, a space in the game where i can you know make a balance pass or lob it over it's just a read and it's a feel for me so it's i love to say you know it's, it's so hard but it feels easy for me do you, so I wanted to ask you sort of why you think that your basketball IQ gets overlooked, but I think it goes along with this um, angst that some fans have because you are not a natural scorer. And is it more is it more joyful for you to get an assist than to make a bucket yourself? Or are they or are they one and the same to you? It's the same. I think it's the same. But also, it depends how we get the bucket. Like, I want to get easy buckets, you know? Um, and it's a team game also. It's easier to guard one guy that's, you know, just his only thing is to score. That's, for me, like, I'm a defender also. Like, I know guarding somebody that just wants to score, it's easier for me to focus on that than LeBron, who makes everybody better. So scoring and assists, it's, it's the same thing to me. It's like, I'm a winner. I want to win. And that's that's always been the, the goal for me. Brett Brett was sort of the the guy yeah. that said you're going to be the point guard, and you weren't drafted as a point guard. Obviously, people knew you had playmaking skills. We've all seen the the summer league highlights from Vegas where you're throwing wicked <laughs> passes and all that stuff against guys that weren't drafted. Um, <laughs> but but Brett was sort of the guy, um, and early on in that process. Um, what were the sort of adjustments? What were the difficulties in sort of transitioning into the full-time playmaker and ball handler? Um, it's a responsibility. It's like you, you're given a lot of responsibility 
to take care of the ball, which I didn't really realize until probably my second, third year, like how important that was. Um, and then controlling the pace too. That's something else, you know, I was able to kind of learn, like controlling the pace, reading the game, looking at the clock, knowing what's going on, what plays I need to run, who needs to get a shot, who needs to get going. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of things that go into it, um, that people just don't, the average person wouldn't know, but yeah, it's, it's, um, I think for me, it was just a learning experience and it was, it's kind of cool. You know, he's like, yo, you're the point guy. I'm like, sick. Let's go. First game, John Wall. Let's, let's do it. Um, but for me, it was just a learning experience. What about the other side of the ball? Um, because I, when I got to Philly, I was 34 going on 35. Yeah. Very spry 34 year old. But, uh, Lloyd Pierce <clears throat> was our defensive guy. And early in the season, we started Jared Bayless for like two games, two or three games. Cause Jared, could guard point guards and you weren't guarding point guards. Yeah. And then they put me on the, Jared went out of the starting lineup. They, they made me guard point guards. So I would start the game on like Kemba and John Wall <laughs> and Damian Lillard. And I'm like, I've never fucking, I couldn't guard right. these guys when I was 25. What are you doing to me? But then later on, you sort of adjusted and, and you got to the point where you were guarding essentially all five positions. Yeah. Was that, a learning curve? Was that a commitment, a focus? What sort of went into that process of making that adjustment? It's all of that. It's a focus. Um, it's another responsibility. Like looking at some of the guys I have to guard every night, it's exhausting, but it's a huge responsibility. Like not everyone is able to do that. Um, so I take pride in that and just being able to, you know, make that or do that for my teammates. You know, I know it's a big responsibility. So doing that to help us win, like, it's easy to me. Like if it's, if that's going to help us win, knowing I have to hold him to a low shooting percentage one night or, you know, whatever it is, make some plays, get some steals, whatever it is, I'll do that. Cause I just want to win. Um, but for sure, it's, a, it, that's a learning experience too. And like having to guard like Giannis, LeBron, Kawhi, Paul George, Chris Paul, like everybody. It's not, there's no one in the league that I haven't had to take that challenge with. Well, the person I was going to bring up, I think this was maybe your first game in Dallas. It was one of your first games in Dallas. You played them and it was down there and you were guarding Luca. Yeah. And you've always defended, like it's, Luca's a very difficult guy to defend. Obviously you've always sort of defended him as well as anybody can. But I was just going to sort of ask you just from a mental stamina standpoint about like, if you like know going in, you're, you're Ding Luca all night, basically. And you're going to have to deal with that all night how you can have the bandwidth to basically do both. It's that's tough too. Like going into a game, especially in the playoffs, I think it's tough. For, it's obviously tough in the playoffs, but playing both sides of the ball is extremely tiring. Like having to go guard, especially Giannis or somebody like that, a bigger guy that's running all day. It's tough. Um, that comes with it. Um, and no, it's fun. Like getting to guard the best players in the world. It's, it's fun. Like it's fucking taxing, but it's fun. I've, I've never used fun and defense in the same sentence. I'll be honest with you. I've never done that. Is there a type of player, whether that's, uh, you know, a, a, a water bug type point guard, like a, like a Trey Young, who's yeah. very shifty and quick and, and all that, or a, a catch and shoot guy that's run off screens or an ISO guy or a big guy like Giannis? Like, is there a type of player or, or a specific player that is the toughest challenge for you? Is the toughest type of guy to guard? They're all, there's a lot of guys that are tough in their own ways. Uh, yeah, Gian, but Giannis, like, <laughs> what are we talking about? Like, it's guys Giannis, like that are Giannis. like full speed downhill, 10 steps dunking. It's tough. Um, LeBron, he makes people better. So you gotta, instead of, I can't always worry about him because he's making somebody else better, you know, making the play, whatever it is. Um, even Trey Young, last, the last time we played them, um, there were just a lot of calls that you can't be too physical, like, I'm 6'10", guarding somebody who's like, what, how, many, how much do you weigh? Like 200 pounds, whatever it is. You think Trey Young weighs 200 pounds? I don't fucking know, bro. I don't know, maybe ben, put some muscle on, bro. Like, I, ben, I no when I idea. played, I weighed 195. <laughs> so just some context there. You might have bulked up, who knows? But <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's different in every way. Um, and some of the guys are unbelievably talented. And then you have certain refs that will give guys certain calls, but it's, it's basketball, man. So with, with all this good, I, and I... I you probably don't pay attention, but I, I've said this publicly about you, whether it's on the podcast or whether it's on television. Um, and I've certainly said this to random people on golf courses that ask about playing with you and what it was like playing with Ben. 
you know, the, the narrative around you, unfortunately, uh, because of the shooting narrative, all the awesome stuff you do sort of gets not overlooked because you've won, you know, been all NBA, you've been an all-star, you've been on all the defensive teams, but that, that narrative around the shooting is so constant. How frustrating is that? Um, I think for a while it was just, it's so repetitive. You're hearing it all the time from everybody. You're like, fucking hell, like just get off my case. Like I do other stuff too. Like I'm guarding the best players. And that's one thing I don't, I don't think people respect that enough. Like what I'm bringing to the court. Cause it's a lot of shit I'm bringing to the court. Um, and for me, I just want to win. So people also don't understand my goal is to purely win. I don't go out there. I'm not trying to have this many points, you know, whatever it is, my goal is to win. So I'm trying to do whatever I can during the game and make the right plays and the right reads to help my team um, win. But that is for sure frustrating. Um, but it's also one of my weaknesses. So it's like, when we get mad at people for saying I'm not good at something, like, okay, yeah, cool. I'm practicing to get better. It is what it is. Um, and that's just a part of the game. Like, I don't think if I, if I was like a guy who was that sucked and people didn't care, then people wouldn't be mentioning my name, which is also for me, it's like, I'm proudful of being who I am because people expect a high level of basketball from me. Um, which I love because, you know, I would rather be who I am than not on the fucking court. Yeah. Well, I think it's fair to nitpick players and there's, you know, you, you look at Giannis and Giannis has won MVPs and he's widely considered the best or one of the best players in the world. And people nitpick his shooting. People nitpick his yeah. free throws. And there's just not a perfect player. Um, when the shooting dialogue comes up, though, the thing I always talk about, and I think it was Kirk Goldsberry who first really shared this. He's a stats guy from ESPN. But your three-point shot creation for others over like a three-season stretch was number one in the league by far. You know what I mean? So like, yes, yeah. you weren't shooting threes, <laughs> yeah. but you were getting guys we like about me. Trey too, when Trey yeah, Trey you were. This up yeah, about you. We, you were getting guys like me open looks. Yeah, and that's yeah. That's I think I've I've looked at the numbers too, and they're pretty they're pretty crazy. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. I don't want to do my own horn, but um, but yeah, like. That's and that's what basketball is to me. Like if I have JJ Reddick here and he's, I can get him open and get a great shot for him. Why would I not do that? You know, um, and for me, like that's easy. Those, those are easy buckets, and you know, you, we we're trying to make that team guard everybody, not just one guy. Um, so yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say, you, you know, we we were talking about this before you you got here about the your your discipline to not respond. To yeah. some of these because oh, there's been a lot so hard. there's there's, there's so been a lot hard. and we get we can get into specifics with that but there's just been a lot of bullshit there's been a lot of craziness yeah. there's a lot of stuff that people say that at, even at the time we were like you know we obviously are biased towards you but it's also like you shouldn't say that about anybody much less somebody that we like you know you're a young guy like i think anyone at any age is going to respond eventually but you've managed to sort of like keep this sort of stoic focus of not doing it how do you do that because it's really hard every time i've like written tweets and then just deleted them or like went to dm somebody and then just deleted it there's so many times or tried to find somebody's number and then just left it uh it's so hard but fuck it comes with it like i am who i am people want to use my name to say whatever it is what it is um i can't i can't really worry about it too much uh, i couple maybe two or three off seasons ago there was a, a viral video that went around of you draining threes in pickup yeah. games i think it was in los angeles right yeah. it was in la um and i i was around you for two seasons yeah. and i i watched you work i watched you shoot every day after practice every day before practice whether it was free throws spot up threes whatever um in some ways did the shooting thing become bigger than it should have been and fuck with you a little bit. Like I always for wanted, sure, I, I wanted to always ask you like, Brett said you could shoot, dude. Shoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nah, for sure. And I didn't really realize that early on my, in my career. Cause then it started building up. I'm like, like they saying I can't like, should I not? Like I'm fucking confused now. Like, I'm, you don't want me to shoot, but you want me to shoot. Like, I don't know. So it did fuck with me a lot. Um, but I kind of found peace in a place where I'm just like, fuck it. It's basketball. Like, I'm great at the game. Like I need to go out there and show people what I can do and, and, and my talent. Um, so it did for a while. I was just like fucked up a little, but it is what it is. Like you go, I feel like that 
all of this stuff that's happened in the last few years for me has kind of helped me grow and mature in a way that I don't think I would have if, you know, I didn't have those experiences. Are you going to shoot threes this season for the Nets? Yeah, I need to. I need to just <laughs> go out there and put some up. <laughs> should just make a goal. I'm going to shoot five a game until they yeah, tell me to stop I'll shooting do, fucking 20 threes a game. <laughs> If you shot, if you shot. Kevin's five, wide open. Nope. So <laughs> <laughs> like, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, part, of, part of our shared experience, besides being teammates and getting to compete together and being in a lot of big games together, was, was playing in Philadelphia. Yeah. And, and I have spoken uh, about my love of the city of Philly and how much I enjoyed playing there in front of those fans. It, that's not to say that it's always a perfect environment it's a very oh, yeah. tough place to play do you feel like the the lack of shooting the non-shooting was magnified because you were in philly uh, people in philly just want to have something to say about <laughs> fucking anything man like everything like literally everything you know i post a picture of a fucking car or a dog i got reporters saying you should be in the fucking gym like come on man but yeah for sure philly is obviously a, a, a sports city um and my experience playing there was incredible. Like for the most part, it was incredible. I had a great time. Like the fans are unbelievable. Um, I still have an apartment there. So I do own some real estate in Philadelphia still. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I feel like I'm part of Philly still, but, um, yeah, it's, it's just unique. Like even being in Brooklyn now, it's, it's completely different. Like this is a different experience for me. And, and, you know, I value just that time I did spend in Philly because, you know, I was able to learn and grow, um, in that city and I got, friends for life there. I got, my brother lives there. Like I got family there. Um, so yeah, Philly's great. I don't, I think people have like a, a thought that I think that, that, that I hate it. What do you think about the process now looking back? Um, looking back now, I think the process was, I mean, people look at it like the process of like the team, like Philadelphia winning the championship, whatever it is. But I think for us, shit, we were going through the process, like building Philly up. There was a moment where Philly, no, no one wanted to play for Philly. It was like 10 and 72 games. Like that's, and what we were able to do there was, was great. Um, you know, I feel like we brought a lot of life back into the game of basketball in Philly. Well, I think the, the general thesis of the process is like, we're going to build through the draft. We're going to try to draft transcendent players. You, historically need basically a top five or two top 10 to 15 guys to win a championship. And you're not guaranteed to win a championship. No. So if you draft a couple of those guys, and let's be honest, they missed on a lot of picks. Yeah, They missed on a lot of picks. And if you do end up drafting a couple of those guys and you become a contender and you become a place where free agents want to go, where guys get traded and they want to resign there. And all of a sudden there's a culture and an environment where winning is really valued and you feel like you're in it every year. Like that to me means the process worked. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Cause no, I think I everybody thinks the process didn't work because they haven't won yet. Yeah. It's not like, it's, you're not guaranteed to win a championship. You just don't want to be got, in the middle. Yeah. You just don't want to be in the middle. Yeah, you, you don't, don't want to be what the Pacers did for the last 20 years. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. Like you, I, you can keep that in there. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. Like we we've built something there. Like people want to play there now. Like you got Joel's there. Like Tobias is there. Um Jimmy came to Philly. Like we've had great players. Um it's just a matter of putting it all together. Um and that's that's what the process is. Well, also, and we've talked about this, you know, he gets mad every time it comes up on the show, but we've talked about it a million times about the Raptor series. That was an amazing that was a championship level team yeah. by any metric and you lost on a crazy shot but that was a team that you never know what's going to happen but there's no reason that team could not have won the championship if that, if that shot had not gone in and right. so that to your point about luck is like that happens yeah. sometimes but it doesn't mean that it didn't work to get yourself to, to the position to you know make it a possibility well I also feel because Joe, Joe and I have talked about this yeah. and he when I was his teammate and even since I retired and stuff you know, I wish that I was like five years younger when I joined you guys. 
because I, I, I wish I had what I, you know, the, the, the veteran presence yeah, yeah. that I had at 29 or 30, but I still had a longer w- runway of my right. prime. I came to you guys at the end of my prime, right. you know, so I didn't have this long runway. So I think some of it was we were good enough, but like when we, when our best players needed to be at our best, we weren't good enough. Right. Whereas like Kawhi, that series was fucking good enough. Yeah, he was I always go back to game four. We're up 2-1. We've got a double digit lead in the fourth. And Kyle Lowry has said this to me multiple, multiple times. He's like, I thought we thought the series was over. You guys are going up 3-1. And then Kawhi just goes full on Michael Jordan Ro- mode. Robot mode. <laughs> <laughs> and so, robot mode. So again, some of it, this is why it's so hard to win a yeah. championship because so much timing and not it's a, not always luck. And certainly you could say Kawhi's yeah. shot was luck or them not calling a travel was luck for them. <laughs> He did get a running start. For sure. 100%. I'm going to bring this every time the shot. I'm going to bring it up. Every time the shot comes up. up in the Raptors facility. And they're just like, what are you doing? Yeah, like, <laughs> I know. Sure. Raptors fans hate me because of that. It's so bad. But no, you just, you need a bunch of stuff to happen um, to win a championship. And something's got to go right for you. And potentially something's got to go right or wrong for, for another team that you're facing. And so, you know, we just, that team to me was as good of a team as I've played on in the NBA. Right. Um, you know, we were we were close. It's fall, so why are you still sweating in your pants like a savage? Seasons change, and so should your undies. Grab a few new breathable pairs of Tommy John underwear. In Tommy John underwear, you're that much more comfortable, so you can do everything a little better. Name a problem with other underwear, and Tommy John has solved it. Tommy John's breathable, lightweight fabric has four times the stretch of competing brands. They come with a no-wedgie guarantee thanks to a non-rolling waistband and legs that never ride up. Plus, they feature a horizontal quick-draw fly. Hammock pouch support stops the awkward swing and slap, giving everyone something to be grateful for. With over 17 million pairs sold, people love Tommy John underwear. That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers, they have fanatics. I honestly love my Tommy John because of the breathability. It's just so refreshing, which is not an adjective you would normally use to describe your crotch region. You have to try it. Go to tommyjohn.com slash JJ right now for 20% off your first order. That's 20% off at tommyjohn.com slash JJ. Again, tommyjohn.com slash JJ. See site for details. Let's go, let's go, let's reverse gears a little bit. Let's go back to your sort of upbringing. Yeah. When did you first fall in love with basketball? I mean, ever since I knew what basketball was, really. Um, but you know what's crazy? I was actually watching on Netflix the the N one. Have you seen that? The N one. Oh, yeah, the N one documentary. Yeah. yeah. Growing up, that's who I used to watch the most. Like the professor, um, Escalade, uh, Hot Sauce. Those are the guys I really watched when I was younger, because obviously the games overseas you know time difference um but i've always just loved the game and, the, and like the it's like art for me it's art going out there and be able to move that's my i can't dance at all so that's my dancing right there um but i've always loved the game yeah since i was you know since i knew what basketball was at what point uh did you feel like the nba was at least a realistic no that was that was it as soon as i knew what the nba was i was going but at what point did you feel sort of confident enough in your, whether your size or your skill set or whatever it is, where you're like, oh, you know, you never know what's going to happen, but this is a thing that is, you know, on the horizon. He's 6'10", something. Tommy. He can make any fucking pass. <laughs> <laughs> For me, nah, I always knew. Like, it wasn't about like how, you know, the confidence or anything. It was just like, yeah. fuck, like, this is what I want to do. Let's, let's see. Like, even the first camp I went to, Pengo's All-American camp, I'm playing guys who are like windmilling, like, like seniors, and I'm a freshman. And my, like, I'm, inside, I'm like shitting myself. I'm like, holy shit. Like, I was just watching Andrew Wiggins. I was just watching Julius Randle, these guys. And then I'm on the court, you know, competing against a lot of these guys now that I've been not in the league now. But for me, it was just having the opportunity to go play and then competing against the best. It was just like, this is what I want to do. Is, is that why you ended up at Montverde? So I had, after Pangos, I did Adidas Nations with Australia. I did a bunch of camps. Um, my name kind of blew up. Um, through the high school scene. I had offers from everywhere. Uh, and then Montverde, honestly, was just academically the best school uh, for me. And then my family also felt, you know, comfortable with me going to a boarding school. And, you know, they, Coach Boyle was great. Um, and just the system they have there is, that was terrific. So if you were worried about academics, why did you go to LSU? <laughs> after Montverde, <laughs> after Montverde, 
I was going to league. <laughs> I was like, you, you know, I'm out. A, you just needed a layover. You yeah, I was just layover. somewhere, you know, warm. You knew nah. your destination. You just needed a layover. Everyone thinks I got paid too, which is not true. We have talked about this. We've talked. Everyone about this thinks I got paid. I did not get paid. If I did, I would just say it. Like, there's nothing to hide now at this point. Um, but my godfather was the assistant coach, Dave Patrick. He was there, and I just felt comfortable going there. Um, yeah. And I had a great time. LSU's great. Uh, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Before you interject there, I want to follow up on that. I spent two years with you. Yeah. I know that you have a good time. What was what was college Ben Simmons like? <laughs> <laughs> what was college Ben Simmons like? It didn't even feel like college for me, honestly. It was just, it was kind of surreal. Um, even like from, but from the start before I even got there, like the day I'm getting there, it was just 20, 25 is coming. Like that was the jersey number I had. 25 is coming. He's on the way, whatever. And it like it didn't feel like I was a student there. It just felt like I was it's fucking, it's fucking hanging out there, <laughs> having a good time. But it was uh nah, like I had a great time having that college experience. Like I'm so happy I went to college and did that, especially a football school like LSU. It was you know incredible. I feel like we were talking about this before you guys got here. I feel like you were early in this wave of players going after the NCAA. Like you did the doc, the doc about yeah. it. And then you've done, you've talked about it since then. And other, do you feel looking back on it now, do you feel the same? Do you feel any differently? I care less because I'm not involved and in I'm obviously in the league now, but I, there's, there's a strong, like I, I care a lot about the way it's handled and what's going on in terms of college. Cause I feel like obviously you can't, I don't know. I just feel differently, you know, when people use people's name and like likeness um, and, it, and are able to generate so much money off these athletes. Um, cause if you look at it now, guys, you know, people on TikTok and all this stuff, like 16 year olds making millions of dollars and all this. But for me, it's just principle. Like if somebody's generating this much money, then I feel like, you know, you should obviously give back to those people. What was, uh, what was draft night like? Long. Um, long. Yeah. You're the number one pick. Yeah. You, didn't have to you know what you No, no. You know, you know how much media else. had to do after that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I had to do a lot of media. Everyone watching this is like, fuck you. No. This is not a top five pick who went 37. This is the number one guy. That moment, like, it's surreal. And for me, like, it's, you know, being from Australia and being the number one pick, it just felt like I was in a fucking movie for like months, like being at LSU. It just felt like it, like it wasn't real life. Um, and then, you know, my main focus is not to trip up the stairs. That's my focus. Uh, but overall, I had just an amazing experience to be at, you know, be at the Barclays Center and hear your name getting called and be on stage. There's nothing, there's nothing that compares. Um, in your, in your first rookie year, you broke your foot early on. What's, what's going through your mind? I've seen the tape, by the way. I, I don't know why they showed me the tape, but they, it was practice footage. At the, at the was, practice I like, facility. I think it was like two or three you went minutes up left. For a lob, right? Was that, was that what it was? I think it was a rebound. Or was it a rebound? I think it was, okay. I was going up. I remember who it was, too. <laughs> you remember Sean Long? Uh, you guys had Sean like 72 Long. players in two seasons. I don't remember yeah. everybody. <laughs> so I went up and just landed on his foot. Um, nothing dirty. It was just freak accident. I heard it snap and I was just hoping that it wasn't broken. But in my head, I knew I was like, I broke my foot. Um, so that for me, that even that was just a lot, you know, the rehab, that grind to get back to where you, where you were supposed to be, you know, it's tough. Um, it's taxing. And on top of that, you know, it's supposed to be a, a good moment. You get drafted, you know, it's supposed to be playing your first NBA game as a rookie. Um, that didn't happen, but it, it taught me a lot, you know, how to kind of be a professional, you know, now it's serious. It's the rehab is a lot goes into it. I was going to ask, is there something that whether or not you've talked to him or not, you don't have to share if you have, but for like Chet, for example, who's going through this, is there something you learned uh, in that process that you feel like somebody who's that highly regarded, you know, there's, there's, that, there's so much hype going into their rookie season and all of a sudden it's gone. Yeah. Is there something that you learned that you would share with him? Um, for me, it was just blocking out all the noise and, and grinding. So that like, I kind of turned into a robot with my rehab. I was like, I need to, come back stronger, faster, and better. Um, and this is the opportunity that I have. So I didn't really look at it like a, a negative. I tried to turn it into a positive to where I was just, okay, I have this much time. I need to get ready for next season. The team said, that's okay. This is my focus. Um, and this is my season now. So this is what my season looks like. That next year, your second rookie year, 
Um, <laughs> we'll talk about Donovan in a second. <laughs> that first game, we, we started the season in D.C. I think it was an ESPN game, if it I'm was, not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. Yep. You haven't played in, I mean, it must have been 18 months by then since summer league. Yeah. What's going through your head? I was talking to myself a lot. Like it, every, every moment, <laughs> like I have like myself talking to myself. Um, it was just like, okay, I got the ball. I see a gap. All right. Lay up. Like I was just trying to like get comfortable on the court and talk to myself and just relax a little bit. But like once I got my first bucket, I was like, oh, this is, I fit. Like I'm, I'm supposed to be here. During that year off, did you have reservations about whether or not your game would translate, your skill set would translate? No, nah, I knew. Because yeah. I like, from, like going out there, I was, what, I was in 1920, 1920. Like I'm physically, I know it, I'm able to be here. It's just like that next level of, okay, learning the game, the speed of the game, the tempo. You're playing against grown men, you know, have been doing this for a long time. So that's what it was. It was just learning and, and trying to sharpen everything that, you know, I was able to uh, do and just do it at a high level. The back and forth, and it wasn't necessarily you and Donovan going back and forth, although he did wear a It was Donovan <laughs> coming at me. It was everybody coming to me and me just shutting up. That's what it, it's always so fucking been like that, it. man. <laughs> I'm sick of this shit. It really, now that I think about it, Donovan wore the Adidas sweatshirt yeah. to a game, you know, ton of walk with rookie and the definition of a rookie on the, you know, whatever. Yeah. Did any of that bother you? No, because it was so pointless. But at the moment, it was like, it was everything, you know, like for us, we're like, I'm going to get it. Now he's going to like, it was, it was a big moment for us. Like in that moment, that's what we cared about. Um, actually, I didn't really care too much because I kind of felt like I was going to be rookie of the year. Um, but no, nah, it didn't really bother me. It was fun. Like it was fun having that little banter, you know, with Donovan because he's a great player. And if I wasn't there, he would have obviously been rookie of the year. I broke my foot though. So this is the second time now where you've essentially taken off, call it 18 months, year yeah. and a half from your last game, and then injury happens. Um, do you have reservations about this season, about your own physical ability, about your your own ability to play? Or no, because no, you I'll have be, this this like foundation, you know I'm good. No, I'll be I'll be great. And I'm excited to play with, you know, Kev, Kai, Joe, all those guys like we just have an unbelievable team. And I know it, like for me, um, after surgery, I know what I knew it was going to take to get back to where I need to be. And I've been locked in. Um, it's been tough. Like obviously no, no, uh, rehab is easy, but it's a grind. Um, and that's what it's all about for me. Like that's my mini season. Every time I've had a situation where I've been hurt or whatever it is, that's my time to lock in and focus and get to where I need to be. Where do you see yourself sort of fitting positionally? with that group and obviously Kyrie I guess he's a point guard but functions more as a scoring guard um are you the primary ball handler are you the other thing I've talked about this a ton and I, I've said this when you when they made the trade or even before they made the trade I always said like Ben would be such a good fit with the Nets because if I think about a closing lineup in the playoffs with you sort of as a playmaking five offensive hub short roll making plays to shooters running pick and roll with Kevin and, and Kyrie. Like I always envisioned, and then being able to switch one through five, like I always envisioned you, that being sort of the best version of you in the playoffs. Yeah. Um, 100%. I think just like the the talent that we have and the, and the type of players that we have, we're going to be able to run run the floor easily. You know, we got Clax who can run. He moves incredibly well. Um, Kev, Patty, Kai, Joe, um, just got Royce, another great three and D guy. Um, I'm missing people, but yeah, I think this, this team right now is just a great fit f for what I do and, and what I bring to the game. Um, I feel like it's Philly on steroids kind of in terms of what we had when, you know, you were there and Marco and, and Urson. You're saying Kevin's better than me. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. I mean, you know, he's mm, got some <laughs> shit to his game, but. I think, yeah, I just think it's exciting. Like, knowing I'm going to play with those guys and knowing their games, like, I don't have to fucking guard Kyrie and Kevin. Yeah, well, I was gonna, I was going to ask you when we were talking earlier about Giannis and Luka and these guys who yeah. are so tough. To, how, how are other teams now, luckily it's not you, how are other teams supposed to defend Kevin? I have no idea. I like, how did you do it when you were playing against them? 
You don't guard Kevin. <laughs> no one guards Kevin. That's what they say. You just hope he misses. Yeah. You just hope he, like, like those guys are just so incredibly talented and they just so f- like their focus is incredible. Um, just seeing them work. But yeah, you, no one's guarding Kevin or Kai. How has your sort of experience been since you've been traded with the Nets organization? And obviously there was speculation about when you would come back either in the regular season or the playoffs. Um, and of course you got hurt and required surgery, but just these last sort of six months, like how has your experience been with this specific organization? It's, uh, it's been, it's been great. Like, obviously it's going to be good, you know, getting traded anywhere the first few moments, but it's been consistent. Um, the foundation they have is great. Coaching staff has been incredible. Uh, trainers have been great. Like everyone's just very, it's a, it's a, it's a very calm place to be. Um, but it's a good environment. Like just going in there every day, it's, you know, everyone's got a happy face on. Everyone wants to work and, and is very locked in, um, you know, when you go into that facility. Can we clarify that you did not leave a group text? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I hate about the internet. Just fucking people just make anything up and it just gets taken too far. Um, but no, I didn't leave a group chat. You know what's funny about that? I actually texted. So hold on. Who reported this? It was, uh, Rick, I almost Rick, DM'd Rick, him. Rick Buker. Yeah. <laughs> I know where. I almost DM'd him, man. Out of left field. Wait, go ahead. So I actually text Patty about that. I was like, yo, did I, did I leave a group chat? Like, I was so confused. Like, he's like, bro, no one even said anything in the group chat for like a month. Like, at that moment, there was nobody even talking in the group chat when we got to the playoffs or whatever it was. Um, so no, I didn't leave a group chat. The, the other one that I think got thrown around a lot, including, uh, by my colleague, Stephen A. Smith, um, Sort of questioning, and I want to get to sort of you sitting out the season in in a second, but questioning how you got hurt if you weren't playing. When did this sort of back injury... Look, I I was with you when you had back flare-ups all the time when I played with you. I did too. Like, it just... Yeah, that would... Like, how did it happen? I was actually going up the stairs. So, initially, I had some, like, soreness in my back when I was working out. Um, then I went to like go hop up the stairs, run up the stairs and my whole right side just dropped. And as soon as I went upstairs, I laid down and it could not move. Um, you saw me in Milwaukee, right? No, no, you weren't there in Milwaukee. I had the same thing where I was, I went up for a layup against the bucks. I oh, twisted. no, no, that was, the, that was the year after I left. After, yeah, yeah. yeah. I went up, twisted. Um, and as soon as that happened, I knew I was like, oh, I can't even move. Like it shot down my leg. Um, I was in so much pain the whole games, you know, Scott absolutely had to pull my leg and give me traction. Otherwise I was going to be like, felt like I was fucking dying. Um, I was, I was throwing up cause I was in so much pain. Um, the pain goes all the way down your leg. I couldn't sit like this. So I couldn't sit in the car. Um, every, everything I was doing was just fucking painful. Uh, but yeah, I was, I ran up the stairs and my whole right side just dropped. Which disc was it? L four five L four five yes I mean I, look I as from somebody who uh, has ha- had their fair share of back injuries you know I had L I've had L five S one degenerative probably my whole life you know I, I mean they discovered it uh, my rookie year uh, around the draft and like there was questions about whether I'd be able to recover from that you know what I mean and my first year with the Clippers L three my quad stopped working I had a nerve disruption and my quad stopped working so I'd like. I never had surgery. I never went to surgery, but like that was something that I always had to monitor. If you did an MRI on my back right now, you'd find three herniated discs. Like I I can function because I, you know, have figured out ways to sort of combat all the different triggers or whatever. Um, The process of coming back from this surgery. It's tough. um, Versus the normal sort of maintenance you have done over the last few years as these things have popped up here and there. Is there a huge difference? Is, Is one harder? Um, in terms of rehab for yeah. this, the surgery? Yeah. Uh, yes. And yeah, for sure. It's, it's a, it's a process, you know, it's back surgery. So first few weeks, I'm not doing anything. Um, but I'm, I walked out of surgery. So it was, it was a huge relief actually. And you know, that nerve has, needs time to grow back, um, and heal. So that connection between my brain, my nerve and my leg was slowly coming back. Uh, when I had the, yeah, when I had, the issue, my foot was limp. Like I couldn't, yeah, I'm dragging my foot everywhere. I barely could walk. Um, but that process of getting back, it was tough, but it was just, 
it was uh, for the whole time I really just had to be focused and locked in and knew it was going to be, you know, timely, but, you know, over days and, you know, keep adding them up and having good days and, and getting back to a good place. I don't know why I just thought of this, you know, <laughs> like I feel like for whatever reason, we've kind of talked about this and hinted at this. Um, but y- you know, for someone who is very accomplished in their career, um, me, you, you think, yeah, rookie of the year, all NBA, all star, defensive, yeah, all defensive team. Yeah, I get a lot of negative I, stuff, so it's nice I, to no, hear. No, I'm just saying, like, three twenty six. You're like oh, twenty six years old. You're like <laughs> fucking ridiculed. You're yeah, you're, you're yeah, ridiculed, yeah. and I don't know. I was like, when you were going through the back stuff, and then it came out that you had to have surgery. Yeah. I was just kind of like, man, fuck those people. Yeah, like, yeah. honestly, because I, it's, it's the hard part about the modern athlete and just having to deal with sort of the constant stuff on, on social and <clears throat> 24-7 news and aggregate and all that stuff. But it's like not, not everybody's getting the real story. And for such a nice young man, I don't consider you to be an asshole. Yeah, no. I'm I, don't, really. I, don't, I don't necessarily think... Like maybe some of the ridicule, we we all should be we all should be held accountable for yeah, things. Yeah. Like some of the ridicule, I get, but some of it I think is is undeserved. I'm 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 sorry. Yeah, no, for sure. But fuck, like, what are we gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm here. Um, nah, yeah, it's. But I also know it comes with like who I am. Yeah. So I'm I'm comfortable with people saying what they want. Majority of the time, like unless they're really wrong. Um, then it's a little, and some people are just, they're just dickheads. Like, will say it just to try to put me or bring me down, which is, that just shows more of, you know, who they are, which is fine. Cause I'm keeping tabs on everybody and what's being said. So it is what it is. Like, I'm like, I'm not, the, I'm just not the person to go out and try to like kill somebody else in terms of like their name or whatever and just bring them down. Cause that's just, what would you do hypothetically? Hypothetically, of course, if you were, let's say innocently shopping for candy at a candy store and some guy came in and started calling you Russell Westbrook, what would you do? <laughs> oh man, that was so unnecessary too. Cause I was just trying to get some fucking candy, man. Like I was having a good day in the mall, got some, uh, some hair product from Sephora. Um, and then went to get some candy and this guy came out of fucking nowhere you know what's crazy about it though? They say he's got the camera in his glasses, right? Oh, so you didn't see? He didn't have his nah, phone. Nah, so up. he did have his phone up. But when I kind of saw it was a black screen, so I'm thinking like, oh, he's just playing with me. And that came out a month later. So it didn't come out. That didn't happen. Then come out. It happened a month later. It's so crazy. Yeah, it's just. But I heard he went on the radio and said I rented out the store. There was a, is that, did you rent out the store? How do you rent out a candy store in the mall? <laughs> what am I doing in a candy also, store? Also, who's like, interviewing maybe? this guy? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I have a question. Here's a question I have for, so if you rented out the store, how did he get in the store? Exactly. He's, <laughs> but also, yeah, he's, what the fuck, man? <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's crazy. But I think he went and said that on the radio or whatever, just because he was getting a little bit of backlash and people were kind of like, that's corny. Like it wasn't funny in the moment. It was, yeah. yeah, it wasn't. There was no joke. It was objectively yeah. not funny. Yeah, it just yeah. wasn't funny. We could sit here and laugh about it now, but it was objectively yeah. not funny in the moment. You know what's funny about it? The fact that like out of everywhere in the mall he got me, it was like in the candy store while I'm getting candy. That was <laughs> probably <laughs> followed you around to see. <laughs> I actually, it, it could have been funnier in Sephora. It could have been funnier in Sephora. <laughs> did you rent that store out too? I did, yeah. <laughs> rented out the whole mall. Yeah, rented the mall. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, but my my back question for you, we've talked about this with a, with a few different guys who've had sort of significant injuries, but as pro athletes, you have to be, we're just talking about this in LA a couple weeks ago, you have to be so in tune with your body to a level of you will know when you have something wrong before yeah. anybody else does. And you obviously have known this, you know, for a while because of your injury history. Is that is that something, both with this injury, like, did you, obviously you, the way you described it, you knew right away. But is that a challenge to not be able to describe that to people where you're like, I know that I have this thing, but I can't, there's no word, there's no way that words can sort of define it because the the person watching this or listening at home has no idea what these injuries are actually like. Terrible. Um, 
Yeah, you can't like it's it's easy like because the thing is you have a lot of guys in the NBA that might be like, oh, I'm sore today, like I'm hurt, like I can't play, like <laughs> you know, right? Um, so for me to t- and the situation I'm in is not a normal situation, so it's hard to be like, yo, I I actually can't play. But me knowing me, I'm like, let me just try and and prove them wrong. Let me try to get on the court because everyone's you know saying like you need to play, otherwise you know this, it's gonna be bad for you. And I'm like, all right. So when it got to that point when I'm in practice, like, I know I'm not feeling right. I can't, my muscles, uh, my glutes not working. Like, I can't jump. I can't dunk. And people don't see that stuff. But that was the reality of it. And me, I'm about to play, about to go into game four, try to go into game four. I'm on the, I'm on the ground. I can't even move. Um, so it's a real thing. And it's, for me, it was, it was frustrating because you have everyone saying whatever. Uh, but I try to block that out. And, you know, if I, if I'm hurt, I'm, I'm hurt. Like, I'm not trying to sit out. My, my, Last year, um, you know, I'm dealing with this heel and Achilles injury the whole season. And like by the all-star break, it's to the point where I'm compensating so much that now like my left knee is sore. My right hamstring kept getting tight. Like I couldn't break right because I didn't want to put so much pressure on, on my Achilles, which by the way, was also in pain. So I get PRP or whatever. And then I get traded. So Dallas was great that, you know, we, we came up with a plan for, you know, continue the rehab from the PRP. And we kind of set this target date. And to Tommy's point about like knowing before anyone else knows, like we're like, we're playing, you're going to play Sunday night against Philly. So I'm like, great. So get a great night of sleep, uh, go to shoot around the next day, do all my rehab stuff, get my manual stuff. I'm like ready to go. They're like, do five on O full court up and back. I went up and back one time and sure enough, like my Achilles starts hurting. And I'm like, you motherfucker. Like I've been waiting six weeks to play. And I like, I went, I was terrible. I went and played. I think I played eight games for Dallas. Like never was not in pain. And it's just as an athlete, I think, I think dealing with like a, those type of injuries where it's like, all right, I got to get, do something corrective at some point. I think that's more frustrating than anything else. Like I could compensate for certain things. Yeah, there's a lot I knew with my yeah. hamstrings, like, all right, you know, I strained my hamstring as long as it's grade one, like I can maybe miss a game or two, but I could, I can get back from that. But like the the chronic stuff where it just you there's know some things some you just can't play through. There's some things that you just you can't. Um, but being in the league, like you know, you always have something. Something's always wrong. Like your shoulder, your fucking like so you didn't even know you had. <laughs> um, I popped a rib out. Yeah, like <laughs> you don't even know. But like that's that that comes with it. That's just normal soreness and injuries or whatever it is. But there's some things that you really just can't you can't deal with. You spent. Um, I want to I want to talk a little bit about the Hawks series, your your yeah. last series uh, of playing basketball. Um, but just sort of as like a a general sort of overview of spending the 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 basically a year addressing your mental health and sort of going through that process, which is not a which is not an easy thing. Uh, I've talked about it a ton. I, I I've been through it. Um. It didn't start, I assume, in the Hawks series. So, but did the events of the Hawks series sort of trigger a a deepening spiral or or whatever was going on? Did it did it did it exacerbate the problem? I think it was like, you know, you you're I'm already dealing with a lot mentally just in life, as a lot of people do. But it got to a point where after that series, I'm getting the it's like from the people that you're supposed to have the support from. Or, or that, you know, that comfort from, and I wasn't getting that either. So it was just a lot. It was a toll on me. And then mentally, I just, it killed me. I was like, fuck, like no energy for anything. Like I was in a dark place. Um, and it took me a long time. For, the first thing for me was like really identify like, okay, I got to really, you know, I got to get right. And it's not a physical thing. It's mentally. Um, and just, I think that first thing of acknowledging it is like a huge step for me. And I was like, okay, like I need to address this. I need, I need help in these areas. Um, and being able to do that, that was the start of, you know, getting to where I'm at now. I'm like in a great place and I feel comfortable talking about it now, but those are some dark days for me. Um, and especially, you know, fuck everything's public. Like that's the crazier part. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's something that's like everyone goes through different struggles. Um, some bigger than others, but yeah, it's everyone, you know, has their own battles. And I think that was, tough for me just knowing like I didn't really have that support either from teammates or whatever it was at that no, time. No, call it like it is. Let's let's call it like it is. Yeah, and yeah. I you know that I love Joel and you know that I love Doc. Yeah. But like they they essentially threw for you sure, under the bus after sure. game seven. Like that's that's yeah. that's indisputable. Yeah. Well I was gonna say, you know, both you guys 
it wouldn't, doesn't it just objectively make sense that when you're in a work situation like that, no matter what it is, you would want to leave? Like, I don't know what, I don't know what job you're in where that kind of thing happens, where you would not want to look to do something different. <laughs> you wouldn't want to just like opt right back into that situation after that kind of thing happens. It feels like everybody should want that. And I understand the dynamics of the NBA and the value of a player like you and everything like that. And it's not going to happen overnight. Tommy, but, you know that athletes aren't human beings, man. <laughs> we don't, we don't operate the same sense. way. <laughs> and I think that, that was a part of it too. Like people like, well, let's take his money. And I'm like, I don't give a fuck about the money. Like, I don't care about the money. It's not about the money for me now. Like I want peace and happiness. Like I want to be in a good place. Um, and that, if that cost me whatever it's going to cost it, that's what it costs. Like my peace is more valuable than, you know, money. I under, I don't know the inner workings of everything. Why did you come back for two days of practice? Um, because I was trying to do the right thing. I was trying to. Which day? Are we talking? Are you talking about the day that I got? The day, you, like you came. You you. I, my understanding is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Again, my understanding is there was a there was a trade request at some point before training camp. Yeah, you weren't going to come. Then you ended up coming, and you went a couple of days of practice and then one day doc kicked you out yeah. and you were texting, you know, uh, probably some girl. No, 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 no. <laughs> Hold on. So I might've made that last part up. <laughs> so, yo, people made that up too. I had my Jersey in my pocket, in my sweatpant pocket. So they thought it was a phone. I don't know how they thought it was a phone, but that's what that situation was to clear that up. Okay. So, so um, why did you, why, why did you, because come? I was trying to do the right thing at least like do right by, you know, whatever the fuck the team, the, my teammates, whatever, you know, whoever it is, but trying to do the right thing. And I just was not in that place to play. Like I wasn't, like I just couldn't do it. Um, and I, you know, getting kicked out of that, that practice that day, I actually spoke to Doc before practice. I was like, Doc, I'm not ready. And mentally, I'm not ready. Please just understand that. You know, I tried to let him know prior. And he's like, well, I'm going to put you in anyway. I'm like, all right. Told me to get in. I was like, I looked at him. Like it was like two, it was like, one minute into practice, like, man, get in. I'm like, first of all, no one's, no one's doing that. You're doing this on purpose. And that's how I felt. Too. I was like, okay, so you're, it's like, it seems like everyone's just trying to fuck with me now. Like I have, I'm getting fined for like not lifting weights, but physically I'm like one of the strongest guys on the fucking team. So I'm like, now I'm there finding me for little things. And, and it was just a buildup of, obviously I didn't handle things the right way, but also the team didn't either. And, and you know, the people who had that power, but. What's what's the word? I think it's irreconcilable irreconcilable differences when they talk about a divorce. There's not yeah. one thing; uh, it's just a buildup of things. Would is that sort of how you would describe those five or six months or whatever it was? Three three four months, I guess, because it was a, it was a, a longer season because of because of the COVID yeah. stuff. So it wasn't that long of a gap between the Hawks series and training camp. But is that sort of what it was? Yes and no. Like for me, I was trying to for myself personally, get to a good place, yeah. like to get back on the floor. So it was never even like the getting on the floor was my priority and trying to get myself to a place where I was mentally good to do that. And I was in such a bad place where I was like, fuck, like I'm trying to get here and you guys are like throwing all these other things at me to where I, you're not helping. And that's all I wanted was help. I didn't get it from, I didn't feel like I got it from the coaches, teammates. I won't say all teammates because I had this great, guys on that team that, you know, did reach out that, have, you know, still my friends. Um, but I didn't feel like I, I got that. And it was just a tough place for me. Is that, is that a, you know, we've talked about how this is what you signed up for to a certain extent, yeah. which is the union you're going to have to deal with. But I, I just am thinking about this in your, putting myself in your shoes for a second of like when this kind of thing is happening and we've talked about all these sort of reports that have come out that haven't been true and everything like that, but it feels like it's a cascading thing where what makes this different to my point earlier about most jobs is Everything is public and you have no way to respond. So they could say like, everyone flew out to your house in LA and you said, fuck off and calling the cops and you and stuff like that. And what are you going to do? You can't respond to every single thing. Right. That oh, I, for I forgot that happened. But that's all. Yeah. It's like so many things happen and people don't really realize like, that's not the truth. Like guys, you guys were going to fly out. Now you want to fly out to the end of when training camp is about to start. Like I was in LA for months. Like no one came, like no one was there. Yeah. Like you could have came. Like now you want to make it public that you were flying out. That's bullshit. Like no one's getting on that plane. Um, but come on, man. Like it's fucking truth. Like there were guys in LA that didn't say anything to me. So it, but like that's, that's irrelevant to me. Like there was a lot of things that were just getting put out. Like that shouldn't have been put out. 
and those people know, you know, who they are. But what what happened in the Hawks series? We lost for you for you personally. Because look, I I I wouldn't. I mean, I I obviously played with you for two playoff runs, and you had some monster series. I mean, the, yeah. the series against Miami, our first series together. You know, you were like 18, 10, and nine. Even the series prior to the Atlanta series, <clears throat> you were 14, 10, and eight right. against Washington. Like, you know, you're putting up numbers, obviously playing great defense. And and you did play great defense at times during that Hawk series. But what like what happened? Like you, you weren't at you weren't at your best. You'll admit that. You were not at your best. For sure. And, and so was, what I went into that? Was that the Hawks? Was that nah, you? I think it was just I think it was me and it was a buildup over time that I was kind of like deflecting. Like I was just pushing it to the side and not addressing like my mental health. And I was, you know, it's hard to do that when you don't really know what, like, fuck, why do I feel like this? Why am I feeling this way? And why am I, you know, just different things. And once I was able to really address, it, I was like, Oh shit. Like I need to, I want to get myself right. I want to get to a good place uh, mentally and be able to do my job and, and learn to deal with, you know, things I'm dealing with in, in the right ways and not, you know, going down a downward spiral. Um, Cause there's a lot of people that, that go through it and never address it. Do you, is there anything that you look back on and it could have, I mean, it could have been the Hawks series. It could have been any, at any point in time in Philly. Is there anything you look back on? You were like, you know what? Wish I'd done that differently. No, cause I wouldn't be here. I don't think we could say, yeah, I wish I went up and dunked the ball. Like that was the, cause that was the whole game. Like, come on. Um, no, I think. If I didn't go through what I've gone through the last year or an, and a half, then I wouldn't be where I'm at now. And I think I needed to go through all that and have those experiences to be where I'm at now. That's fair. Yeah. And I, and I think that's true of any human being. Yeah. I think that's, like, I think, that's life. I think whether it's failures, struggles, um, you know, having gone through some very serious mental health stuff myself and having worked through that, like I'm a better human being. I'm a stronger human being because of it. And like, I, I think that's wonderful. I can't, so. We had we had Matisse on um, right before the start of last year, and and we recently had Trey on um, at some point during the playoffs. I think it was in May, and we talked about that play. And you know, I I'd love to just hear sort of your breakdown of what happened on that play because that 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 entire series, you know, you guys are up two one, end up losing two straight great games. You go down three two, you win game six, and you lose game seven at home. Like there was a lot of things that happened in that series. But for whatever reason, that's the play that everyone talks about. That everyone, is, everybody, sort of puts on you as the as the blame, right? The it's like that, basket. that single play. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, in the moment, I just spun, and I'm assuming Trey's going to come over quicker. So I'm thinking he's going to come full blown. And I see Matisse going. There. I'm, you know, Matisse, Matisse is athletic and get up. So I'm thinking, okay, quick pass. He's going to flush it not knowing how much space there was. It happened It happened so quick that you just make a read. And in the playoffs, you need to make the right decisions majority of the time. And for that moment, um, I mean, for, bro, it, it happened and I was just like, okay, fuck, now we got to go make another play. So that's how I'm thinking. And I didn't realize how, you know, everyone's posting. I'm like, is that big? Like, um, In fairness to you, and I, I again, I'm not giving you an out here because you absolutely should have dunked it. In fairness to you, uh, not only was it a spin move, so you're turning. Yeah, I'm, turning. I'm, tr- I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, uh, have people understand here just how bang bang it is. So you're, you're, you're you spun on Gallinari. I think it was Gallinari. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You spun on Gallinari, so you spin baseline. That's so you're, it was. you're, so you're I'm, going I'm in blind, and you, he's coming behind me. Yes, and then you've also got yourself in a little bit of an off balance predicament. Right. You don't know it's Trey right when you spin. No, you're spinning into a jersey. Yeah, essentially. So. Yeah. So I, but look, when it slows down, it looks really bad, Ben. Yeah, no, it fucking looks terrible. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> but when I look at it now, I'm like, man, I should have just fucking punched that shit. But it didn't happen, and I was okay with that. I can live with that. I can live with okay. I made you. Everyone's trying to kill me over one play. Like, I could. You, is, does everyone want to watch film with me? Like the whole arena, and we could. I could dissect everything if you guys want. Um, but that's not. You know, it's not realistic. But we did. We said this at the time. I mean, it was like the whole team blew twenty five point leads. You know, I'm also gu- <laughs> also I'm guarding the fucking best player on the other team the whole game. Her- Herder had like what twenty seven points. 
I have a question about the the, the day of the trade. Yeah. I think it was the deadline. Is it maybe the day before the deadline or something like that? Well, sort of just walk us through your experience when the trade actually happened. But then also, even taking a step back from a second, it was such a like crazy monumental trade of like two max all-star type players in the same conference, 90 miles from each other, basically getting traded at that point of the season. Did you recognize your situation aside, how sort of crazy the thing was? No, I didn't care about I, I literally did not care about who was getting traded for who. I just, in that moment, it was just, I actually broke down. Like I had to have a moment by myself because I was sitting in the office with, you know, I had family around. It was just time was going down and then it happened. And it just was like a, a shock because like, I spent six, six years in Philly, like got friends there. And now you're telling me like, I'm going to New York. I'm like, okay, my, my family's there too. Um, like it was very emotional for me all at once. I had to like sit down and just like gather myself. Well, I was going to, yeah, I mean, this is, we, we've gone over this a little bit. Um, so, you know, sort of bear with me for a second, but like, I, I watched a lot of the stuff that, you know, Barkley and Shaq and those guys were saying, and, you know, oh. he mentioned Stephen A before and everything like that. I, I personally, like, like Jay just said this before, like your ability to withstand that kind of thing is really impressive because anybody at any age would hear that kind of, you know, personal attack and they would feel that this is not somebody talking about my basketball, this is somebody talking about me as a human being. Where are you now? Because you're, you know, you know we've known you for a long time. You're in a really good place basketball wise, but then also mentally. Yeah. Where are you now just sort of looking forward? Is it almost something where you will, when you see that happening to somebody else, does it give you sort of perspective of uh, like almost like a level of empathy you might not have had before because you've now gone through it? For sure. Even like hearing John, you know, you see what John Wall was talking about. Yeah, his situation, like people go through it. Like doesn't matter how much money you got, how famous you are. Like this is real. Like people go through everyday struggles. Um, but he, like, like, I think it's kind of it, ignorant in turn like Shaq and, and Chuck sometimes what they're saying and, and because they have a platform to kind of like protect us and you know you do good um obviously they, they're supposed to you know criticize us you know we're basketball players but when it comes to like personal stuff I think there's a level of like respect they should have um even Shaq like when I was dealing you know with with everything going on I actually messaged him and he put it out and I was like all right but I'm like, Shaq. So you sent him a DM? Yeah, a DM. And I was like, like, why are you saying this if you don't even know the story? Because he always wants to say like, yo, we're LSU brothers. You're my brother, all this, that. If you're my LSU brother, you would have reached out by now. And it's been months since I've been dealing with this. You ain't reach out once and say, hey, you okay? Like, what's going on? The one person who did reach out was Jay Williams. And he had a real talk with me. I was like, I really appreciate that because, you know, you're trying to understand what's going on with me. Because he did say something, and then he took it back, which I appreciate it. And I think it's just a level of, like, people understanding and not just just speaking just to speak not to get clicks or whatever it is so i really respect jay for that that was to me that meant more than anything that was going on um but that's what i that's what you love to see from you know ex players and, and fucking kill o'neill like i got Shaq hating on me like it's crazy but yeah that's i think that's what it is for me just that level of like understanding and respect like don't don't talk if you don't know Ben, uh, you've been awesome. We really appreciate the time. My, my last question for you is, you know, we, we spoke about that surreal moment of being drafted and even prior to that, knowing that basketball was it, knowing that the NBA was sort of preordained to you in a way, um, and then that excitement after a year off. Um, have you thought about, envisioned what that first game is going to be like in a Brooklyn Nets uniform? It's going to be sick. I can't wait. I'm so excited. Um <laughs> Changed my number, got a new number, new jersey. Um, I'm I'm just looking forward to it. I think, you know, we have a special team. I think if we, you know, get it all together, we're we're gonna be the champions. So that's that's the end goal. Um, if you want to make a comeback, you know, put on the jersey, feel free. But yeah, I'm excited. It's 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 New York City. Um, and I'm playing with some unbelievable players. Uh yeah, and a great coaching staff. You ever seen you ever seen like old heads? The, like Alan Houston had a video not too long ago where he's like in street clothes and he hits like three threes in a row. And like, there's that saying, it's like riding a bike. Yeah. It's not, <laughs> it's not, <laughs> I go shoot with my kids. If I'm not shooting every day, I'm not, it's, it's not dude. It's not like riding a bike. I feel you. Riding a bike is very easy. Shooting, shooting off balance, three pointers while you're falling out of bounds, getting fouled. How do you do that, man? Bro, I swear to God, 
By the way, uh, I look at some of your clips. I'm like, my my two sons, Knox and Kai, have been like, they're totally into basketball now. Yeah. And I've talked about this in the, a bunch on the pod. But Knox asked me. I swear to God, I don't know why he keeps asking me this. But he asked me once every two weeks. He's like, Dad, what's the craziest shot you've ever made? And I was like, I've told you. I sprinted down the right side of the floor. <laughs> ben Simmons did some dribble move. He threw it to me. I was falling out of bounds behind the backboard. I got fouled. I made it. Oh, my God. <laughs> my favorite shot I've ever made. It it against is. the Lakers. No, against the Lakers. Yeah, in the Bronx. Incredible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you had so many of those, too. And, and uh, Bellinelli. Bellinelli. You yeah, both were just, like, ones. fucking jumping sideways and shooting three. Like, this is sick. <laughs> Do you have any? Are there any specific... You, you know, you're obviously 100% right now health-wise. Yeah. Do you have any specific basketball things that you're sort of, not that you're, you know, going to unleash them in October, yeah. that, that you feel like are different in your game that people might be surprised by? I think just the way at my pace, controlling the game um, and using, just using my size to get where I want. I think like over time, like even you look at LeBron, like he's not as athletic or, or anything like that, but his IQ and just the way he, you know, he wants to get us to a spot, he's going to the spot. It's just certain things and learning over time, um, just taking out the extra unnecessary movements um i think is huge uh yeah ben again you've been an awesome guest uh we would like to give uh, a special shout out to our good friend sean feeney who um unfortunately we we blew up his uh email last time uh when we shouted out him and lilia and missy we're here at feeney pizza that just opened here in williamsburg in brooklyn uh it's been sold out every night um Go give it. A, go give it a shot. Excellent pizza. We thank thank him for the space and thank you for the time, brother. Appreciate you guys. Thank right. you.